नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् अमित जुहिम ब्लेसेड फुली एलाइडेड वन वी पे हामेंज टू द टीचिंग एंड टू द मास्टर साधु 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 सो वेलकम एवरीबॉडी This is sort of a surprise. We're going to, I, I was groping last night, trying to figure out what to do yesterday. And then I thought sometimes it's fun just to go and look at how precise the Buddha was teaching. And um, I think I don't have all the lights on here. It's okay, if it gets dark, you tell me, okay? Um, So there's two suttas that are in the ex the exposition section of the um, the um, right. You have these expositions in the one section of the Majjhima Nikaya, and 141 is the exposition of the truths, and the second one is the exposition of the offerings. 142. So the first one is Satcha Vibhanga Sutta, and the second one is the um, Dakina Vibhanga Sutta. So what this is concerning, uh, it's interesting to me <laughs> that sometimes we 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 think how precise the Buddha was when he was teaching, and I like to look and find things that show me that he didn't leave anything out. There's an awful lot, and May and I go about talking about this sometimes because I still haven't done it you know the collection of what I call slippages we call them slippages they're not intentional changes but they're things that have slipped across 2600 years and gotten changed or in, they've been eliminated and a story has come up in place of them all kinds of things having to do with the with the teaching and I have a bunch of those that are there one of these days we're going to just go through them all and, and see what you think about them because over the years the last 25 years I've been tracking these and it's fascinating how you find all these different stories about things and what is you know come one of my favorite ones is what is an arahat that's a good one you don't want to become an arahat you'll disappear <laughs> if you disappear how come he was able to teach for 45 years after he disappeared <laughs> there's like the and one guy actually believed this someone told him this in washington dc and he actually believed it i mean if you don't know anything about buddhism at all and you can be told almost anything you know and and you might start believing this so anyway today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the truths first and then we're going to look at the gifts because there's two really nice lessons here that uh, go over um, specific things that are really important to teach someone if you're teaching them about the buddhist practice this practice first of all before we do this meditation in the buddhist meditation we have to keep labeling this the buddhist meditation was specifically to see and understand to witness the arising and the passing away of all phenomena and understand the truth these are the truths of how everything works especially how suffering works how does the suffering work we have most people are exposed if they're lucky now today we have two pieces here but this is one of the slippages all right the the principal one is four noble truths there is suffering there is a cause of suffering there is a cessation of suffering there is a way to the cessation of suffering or there's a way to expand the length of time you can have cessation of suffering however you want to look at that that was what uh, was set up after he was gone that became the prime thing let's not lose this now the reason we shouldn't lose it is not just because it was the summary of buddhism many people just say, oh look that's the summary of the whole thing yes it is but it's got some secrets too 
because those four noble truths are also the specific steps that the Buddha took for his practice of investigating this whole thing. He first had to, you know, there is suffering. Okay, let's go see what the suffering is. Let's figure it out. There's a cause. Let's figure out what the cause of it is, okay? And then the next one was there is a cessation. Well, everybody knows there's a cessation of suffering. If we all have experienced mental suffering and physical suffering, but we've all experienced times where there's no suffering. We've all had happy times. Let's just not throw this out the window and say Buddhists are all supposed to go around, mm, sad, don't smile. No, we are the happy ones. Why are we the happy ones? Because I know something you don't know. <laughs> like my kids running around, I know something you don't know. <laughs> yeah, but you can figure this out for yourself. All of the things that he was teaching, he was very careful to set it up so that you could figure out the same way that he was figuring out and what he was trying to teach his monks in all these suttas as we go through. And we use the Majima Nikaya, and I'm not gonna be funny about this. Bhante figured out everything from the Majima Nikaya, the middle length sayings, because why? Because the middle length sayings has the whole entire teaching in it. This is what Bhikkhu Bodhi explains in the introduction in that. The other books are support structures that came afterwards, but this one is special because it has the whole, the whole thing that you need, okay? But it isn't a book at the same time. You're supposed to pick it up and go read it and say, I just bought this book and I've read it and then shove it in the you know, bookcase and say, I read that one. It isn't like that. This was a systematic accounting of how he was teaching, what specifically he taught, the drills that he gave for practice to his monks that they were supposed to be using, that he used himself. Everything that he was teaching his monks at the time that this was being preserved, everything was what he did. He wanted you to repeat it and exactly. Now, having said that, I think Bonte made the assumption, Bonte Miller MC makes the assumption. I know he did, okay. Because this is one of the common places that we had together all those years. What exactly did this man, the Buddha do? Did he find something? If he found it, are the instructions still there? And if they are there, can I do this again the same way? This is how the preservation starts, where it goes from there. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. You know, it goes all the way around, around and back again in every country you can imagine, up the hill and down the hill and in the valley and in the sea and everywhere. Oh, my gosh. And it turns into all kinds of things to suit the purpose for many different reasons. If we look at Zen, I was spending last week a lot with Zen. Again, Zen was, when you visit Zen, if you spend, when I say visit it, you should try to visit it for about four to six months if you do. And I spent six months with Bonte in a center in Florida, Gateless Gate, and we were exposed to the whole program and how it was operating and everything. And it's a whole different ball game from what we're doing, whole different thing. It is a, a, a kind of thing where you uh, sort of like torture the brain <laughs> with the Cohen's, okay, until you pop. And then the idea is you will get to a place where the answer will go pop and you will open up and have this experience of opening. And I haven't ever really talked to anyone about that opening. I don't know anybody who's gotten there, okay, for one thing to that kind of opening, except the one teacher that we worked with. He's very good. But it's a total different ballgame. Where did it come from? Well, if we look at South Korea and Japan and these places, we're going to see the militaristic, at, at, you know, accentuality, the militaristic effect on this. When we get up, we don't get up and take a walk in the retreat. We get up and somebody snaps two pieces of wood together and we stand 
we turn, we march, dump, dump, dump in a row and follow the person in front of you and march. Now, the good thing about this walking was we do get exercise because we go all around the Zen center, you know, and then come back to the Dhamma hall and then turn, hit, start to meditate again. It's, but this military, it's military, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this. I liked it. Shh, don't tell Bonte. <laughs> I really did like it. And I also liked the fact that someone would swat me on the back and, and, it, and he said, that's horrible. I said, no, actually, it's an interesting thing. They will, uh, you know, walk around, they'll pause after you're sitting in a circle in the tradition that we were in. And one person will come around with a stick that's about this wide. And they will stand in front, uh, walk by. If you bow to them while you're sitting on the floor, then they will turn and they will bow to you and you bow to them again. And then you will lean over and they will swat your back on, the, on like your spine is here. And it'll be like on two sides of the spine. So what does it do? Well, I had studied karate for two or three years and I knew what it was because if you hit something after it's tight, it lets go and relaxes. And so what happens is this is a relaxation from here all the way down to the buttocks immediately in your body. And it's great. And Bonnie said, don't let them hit you. I said, no, it's okay, it's okay. I liked it. Some people don't like it, but this is, this is the kind of thing. This is so far away from where this originally starts. Let's go back to where it originally started. The thing I like, if I tried to put this in a nutshell for you, just put it in a tiny little place for you. The Buddha did a remarkable thing. In his time, everything had to do about the outside of the body and experiencing the, 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 the sensations on the outside of the body. And, um, and it was all from the outside in, and it was also about something else. It was also about the subject and the object, you are the subject and there is an object in your meditation. Did you ever wonder why there is an object in meditation? Did you? There's an object in meditation. Only reason is so you don't float away and stay away. It's so you have a place to come back to and continue sitting. Otherwise, you're going to have to say 10 minutes, okay, 10 minutes, okay, 10 minutes. You know? But if you have this in the system where when you're pulled away and you relax, smile, and you come back to your spiritual friend or whatever your object is, you're coming back. So the boat was not going to float away while you go to sleep. I tell the story about the sailboat that is you drop the anchor. And you don't want to hold tight to the anchor. That's not it. But if you didn't have the anchor, the boat would float away and you'd crash into the, when the tide came in, you'd crash into the beach in the middle of the night. You wouldn't be able to sleep in the boat through the night. It's simple. So it was a returning point. This was really important. So as, you know, over the years, you start looking at all these pieces that are involved in the, in the teaching of the, the, the meditation and everything. Are they all connected? And yes, they are connected. And most of the time, if you find four pieces or five or seven, remember, or eight or 12 they're causally related to each other too. Or they always happen the same way each time. One of the ones that we we're talking about this week um, uh, with some students was, um, was that, um, let's see, uh, the three that are always in a row, when joy comes up, it's not the end of the story. When joy fades away, tranquility arises. And when tranquility fades away, Sukha arises, and the, and the story was about Sukha. The story was about, the discussion was about Sukha. I want to control my Sukha, was the statement. I said, you can't control Sukha. Sukha is an aftermath result of tranquility fading and Sukha arising. Everywhere that we find Sukha, we find there was joy 
and then it fades and then there's tranquility different than any other calm you had in your life before different purer like real cream instead of the cream thing you dump in the coffee <laughs> You know, real cream. You know, it was like it is smooth, this tranquility. And then when it fades away, sukha comes up, but it doesn't have excitement in it. But it, you're happy and you're not sure why. It's sort of like when I say to you, you come to me the first time and I say to you, uh, how long did you stay with your object of meditation before you were pulled away? Oh, about three minutes. Did joy come up, I'll say to you, and you'll say, well, uh, yeah, joy, joy came up, okay? Well, when the joy comes up like that, the joy comes up, it has a kind of excitement in it. But then I'll say to you, why, what is this, what is this joy like? I'm just happy. And I'll say to you, why are you happy? I don't know. <laughs> It's all through, I'm happy. That is genuine uplifted joy. You're light in the head, lighter in the body, and there's no vibration stuff like, you know, flicker stuff. You're just happy. And this, you see this kind of uplifted joy in little children all the time. When you're nursery school, you go and watch them in the nursery school, you're going to see uplifted joy. Yeah, you're going to see pure versions of many things like anger give me back that toy <laughs> but you'll also see you know I want to share with you or you'll see this really pure uh, compassion play out when one of them gets pushed by another one and the one goes over there with their lip out saying you know it's okay it's okay to the other one this is pure compassion you're watching pure compassion. There's no nothing else in the movie yet. This is pure stuff. And we don't get to see this in life. It's not because it isn't there. It's because we're not looking for it, really. Not, not watching for it. Let's go into the sutta and just play and see what happens here. Okay, the exposition of the truth. Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Benares in the Deer Park at Isipatana. And then he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied, and the blessed one said this, at Benares, bhikkhus, in the deer park at Isipatana, the matchless wheel of Dhamma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in this world. That is the announcing, the teaching, the describing, the establishing, the revealing, expounding, and exhibiting of the four noble truths. What for? The announcing, the teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, exhibiting of the noble truth of suffering. I hope I don't have to say that for everyone. <laughs> Just love all these, these wonderful adjectives, okay? Exhibiting the noble truth of suffering, the announcing, the teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, expounding, exhibiting the noble truth of the origin of suffering and of the noble truth of cessation of suffering and of the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So here we've got it. He found the package. <laughs> he found the program. He put it together in his mind. You know, you see him, he's sitting under the tree. This happens. He wakes up. He spends a week under the tree or in that, in that area. Then he figures out his two teachers have already died. He can't go back and tell them. So he's going to walk to where he turns the wheel. And then after that, he leaves there and he goes over to the deer park at Isipatana. At Benares, because in the Deer Park at Isipatana, the Tathagata, he accomplished and fully enlightened, he set rolling the matchless wheel of the Dhamma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. 
And that is the announcing and the teaching and describing and establishing and revealing, expounding, exhibiting of these four noble truths. Now, one thing I say, students will ask me sometimes, what should I be announcing, teaching, describing, establishing, revealing, and expounding to my friends when I start getting involved in Buddhism? And it's actually pretty simple. The Buddha laid down a rule. I think we're gonna to get to it here. I don't wanna be premature here, but the basic rule is you teach what you know. You teach, you, you share with someone the level that you're at. You, and you, you talk, two, two, two things you talk about. You talk about the level where you are at now, and you talk about the level where you're going to try to go to. Now, why? why? Well, when the Buddha set up the meditation school, which is basically like a gypsy thing that's moving around India, okay, and everybody's following it, trying to get on board and try to study with the monks that are helping him to teach now. When he does this, he sets up a system. Now, you have two characters that I don't want you to ever forget. You have, when you go into a temple and you see three characters in front of you, you see the Buddha and two monks. On one side, you see Sariputta. On the other side, you see Moggallana. Why are they so important? It's because Sariputta is the mother and Moggallana is the nurse. What does it mean when you come to learn the teaching Sariputta, the mother, will be nursing you literally on the information, the capsule of information you need, the vital part, that so that you will understand the teaching. That's what we call the, I call it the capsule. It took us a number of years to try to pick out what was the capsule information and what's the excess information all over in these other books. There's nothing wrong with the excess information. You just don't need it in order for you to succeed with your practice to go all the way through at least one time and uh, in, then repeat the uh, cessation again. You don't need it, but it helps you as you're growing your practice. Nothing wrong with this information, but there was a basic foundation that we had to try to find. That's what Bonte frames and uh, builds into his retreats when he built these 10 day retreats that we teach that are nine or 10 days. There are six specific or eight, however you want to look at it, six or eight topics that are very important that are, I remember I said things are causally related sometimes. So the first one is instructions. The second one is the hindrances. The third one is the path knowledge how to, what the path knowledge, you have to understand what path is and what the framework is, but you don't have to memorize it. You shouldn't be reading it in books and trying to memorize that stuff at all. You should just be practicing and discover those pieces. This is what's happening now. Everybody wants to write a book and describe these pieces, but every time we write another book, it describes succinctly the, the actual pieces of everything that happens in first, second, third, and fourth jhana, everybody gets slowed down. Everybody starts going, oh, where am I? Oh, am I here? Oh, is this happening? Is that happening? Don't do that to yourself. None of us did that to ourselves in the beginning. We had this wonderful experience of just discovering you know, what was happening and verifying it with the teacher when we, when we interviewed with Bonte and he tried really hard to train me to do the interviews the same way of just trying to see what's happening by these five little questions that we ask you. That's all. But when we get it to, ex let's expand the questions. Let's turn it into nine. Let's turn it into 12. Let's turn it into 14 questions. Okay. And then let's have the people read this book and that book and this book. Okay. <laughs> but then nobody seems to really move smoothly anymore or get excited about discovering because they have already been told. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why monks don't usually write about these things that way on path. It's hard to find a whole bunch and a whole line of books that are talking about path as so dissecting wise like that. 
And so it's up to you what you decide to do because we live in the land of books now. But I'm just telling you, it's a lot more fun if you just discover it as you go along. It's really fun. So what is happening here is um, he set his school up so that Sariputta was bringing the person in saying, have you got your robe and bowl? Yes, I do. Good, sit down. Now, first thing we're gonna do is breathing exercises. The breathing meditation was the immediate way of calming a person down from the outside, immediate, okay. Then from there, we developed the breathing exercise, uh, the breathing meditation very smoothly using the proper way of letting go of hindrances. That's what he's teaching you. So the, the let's do it again. You got the instructions, then you had the hindrances. The third one was talking about path. The fourth one was satipatthana. Let's straighten out satipatthana. When I say straighten it out, I mean refine our understanding of what it was it wanted you to understand. Refining is not eliminating, not changing, not annihilating. It is just refining it in reference to your practice. And if you look at, uh, go back and look at number 10, what you're gonna find in number 10 is a set of a lot of different types of drills. And the most primary thing it's trying to get across to you throughout the whole sutta is when you're doing those drills, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just what this is as I'm going through this drill. When I start the parts of the body, head, hairs, body, hair, skin, teeth, nail, it's just head, hairs, body, hair, skin, teeth, nail. That's all it is, you know? And when I'm talking to you about each one of the subjects, when I'm talking to you about uh, awareness, full awareness, full awareness of walking, yes, but how it, what is the ultimate awareness of walking they were trying to get you to understand was what is your mind doing while you're walking? What is your mind doing while you're eating? Are you just eating? So the lesson, this is interesting, there should never be an argument about this because it's interesting. The lesson is precisely the same. If I say to you awareness, full awareness when eating, full awareness when walking, but all we're doing is refining it slightly so that you understand it means full awareness of what is my mind doing while I'm eating? Am I having a conversation with my mother's recipes or comparison of the pie? Or <laughs> what am I doing when I'm eating, walking? defecating, showering, everything. Can I, okay, so the bottom lesson, if we, here comes the ice cream cone, May, here we go. The ice cream cone, this is the deductive reasoning and we have to get down here to the bottom right there. And the bottom is, can you do what is happening in the present time and only that, not me, not mine, not myself, not taking it personally, seeing it for what it actually is. He's teaching you, the Buddha was teaching you how to observe something like a microscope. That's what he was doing. <laughs> when we go to 148 in Chichaka Sutta, that's okay, the Satipatthana day would be the, uh, let's say, <laughs> instructions and then hindrances and then path. And then you have the fourth one is satipatthana. The fifth one is dependent origination. We've been talking to you, if we're teaching correctly, we have been talking to you about dependent origination from the moment you walk in the door with us, but you don't know it. You don't know we are. But as we explain five aggregates, three kinds of feeling, as we explain to you, you cannot think of feeling away as we're explaining these things and giving you examples, we're teaching you dependent origination. Now, dependent origination, those seven pieces we give you, the seven link chart is the seven link working chart. That chart is just starting at contact. 
You have six sense doors. Everybody knows I have eyes and ears and nose and tongue and body. <laughs> and I have mind, right? So I have six sense doors. They all work the same way, okay? We know that. So we'll start with contact. Contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, craving arises. With craving as condition, habitual tendencies arise. Habitual emotional reactions. That's what that is, bawa. We think, we ask you to think about it that way because that will click in your mind and you'll be able to start writing down in a little tiny book, little, little book, I don't have much. well, this one, this one is kind of little, little book like this you keep with you and you write down during the day at lunch, how many times this morning did I react or how many times did I do this or how many times did I do this? We, we teach a game. I teach a game to the teenagers. I didn't get it really going, but we have this little book called Nevermind Game. And the Nevermind Game is how many times were you able to say, never mind, let go, relax, smile, come back. Never mind. Every language you can come up with, every language you can dream of. It has a word in it that means say la vie, <laughs> let, let life go, you know? We have, um, I don't have it in front of me, but I looked up 15 languages when I did the book. And we came up with a word in every language, hey, let it go. Let's keep doing what we're doing. Let's not keep fighting or arguing. Let's just let it go and keep going. Hindrance is here, fine, let it go. Let's let go, relax, smile, come back. Let's keep going. We're precise about telling you about the smile. What is it doing? We're telling you clearly, what is it doing, the smile? And the relaxed step, what is that doing? We're trying to get you to understand this science too. So here we go again. <laughs> instructions, this is because of my brain. <laughs> the instructions, and then you've got the hindrances, and then you've got the path. And then you have the Satipatthana, peeking at the Satipatthana. And then you're going to go into dependent origination. And we like to use 38 because it's so much fun. And we still like to pick on Sati, son of the fisherman. We like to pick on him. So we always tell that story. But there are other stories in there, too, that where there were problems, you know, uh, that would lead you into learning dependent origination. But all of the pieces are in 38. The Maha Tanha Sankhya Sutta. That one is uh, the one that you're gonna. We give you the uh, the recitation so you can do it with me when we're in retreat. We had a retreat recently and we handed it out and they were like little children. Oh, we've never done in speech choir before. So they had their little. Uh, when I'm saying something, you're saying it back to me, and we we got this going. So you were reciting it. Yeah. And you recite the pieces. So how did I learn it? I put it on the ceiling over my bed in my trailer. I had it on the door in the bathroom. I put it on in front of me when I was cooking in the little kitchen where I was. I had this everywhere and in my pocket to remind me if I was taking a rest in the forest from cutting trees or something, I was sitting there going over stuff in my mind all the time. I was doing it like all the time. Why? because I wanted to see what would happen if I tried to drown in it. <laughs> what would happen if you, if you start to, to do this? It's the same reason somebody said to me recently, you're so marvelous, you keep quoting these different sutta numbers. And I said, no, it all happened because there were these two, there were these two men. One was a, uh, a Chinese professor and the other one was a um, Burmese, uh, a professor, and they were having an argument with me on the internet, on the Yahoo group in 2004 or 2005, this goes way back. And I got discouraged and I said, I, it was Dr. Tan was there too. He was from Texas, right? And, and these three of them would gang up on me. And the, Dr. Tan especially was a Christian who could just quote things like this. He would always argue with me and quote things like this all the time. And I had been in churches where you learn stuff and we, we do what we call scripture chase. And I thought, I went to Bonte, I said, you know, I want to be like that. He says, then start now. 
<laughs> you have to start and you start writing it down constantly where you're finding the stuff and where which suit it's in and you start building like a card game so that you can have the name of the sutta and what's the sutta about and what's the number of the sutta and what's the name in Pali and what's the name in English that's enough that's enough and you get points for it <laughs> and you start playing against yourself and seeing if you can memorize this this is the kind of stuff we used to play with when i when we were at damasuka in the beginning how can we help people to start remembering this stuff okay so now what we did was we got to dependent origination so what are we going to do next now we're going to rock the boat a little bit the next one we do is anatta the anatta teaching and the anatta teaching is breathtaking to me it's like opening the door and saying, I always wondered who lit the match that made, made craving hot? <laughs> who lit the match that made the craving hot? I did. I did. I, as long as I am in there pushing, 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 I am there. I am the one that is making the heat. I am. It's not a good idea. If you're teaching right now, uh, some of you are just maybe coming or some of you are teaching, but it's not a good idea to teach in the very beginning and say to somebody point blank to them. You know, the reality is the Buddha figured out the suffering is all your fault. And because you cause your own suffering uh, that that, you know, we have to you have to learn all this and then figure out the way you can fix it. It's good that you cause it. It's not the right conversation to have at the front door is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, it is true, but it's not a good idea to do this. Why? Why? <laughs> because over 85% of the population is suffering from depression. They don't like themselves, as Bonte always pointed out to me. They don't like themselves. They hate themselves to some extent. You know, we're frustrated because we see what's happening in the world. And we don't you love how everybody will tell you what's wrong in the world, but nobody will tell you what to do? That's a very frustrating thing. So you sit home and what happens is you blame yourself and you keep thinking it's my fault. And you run as soon as you say to the person, if I, they'll go like this, well, if I cause my suffering, it's my fault. Therefore, I am to blame. Therefore, I'm no good. I'm worthless. Therefore, I'm, I'm, I, I am broken and I, am, I should be depressed all the time because it's me. No, that's not the right way to do this at all. That conversation is a conversation they can come to you with later. And they will when they find out. But it's not something to come at the front door and put that in front of somebody. We've had some bad experiences with this. Okay. But showing them on a piece of paper where you sit down with them and you draw contact feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, the birth of reaction and the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Just that much of this 12 links. You're taking seven links, okay. They can understand and right away they'll go, oh, you mean this depression it isn't me, it isn't mine. It's like any other kind of illness. It's not my fault. I'm not to blame. Wow. That's the first time that happened to me. I wanted to cry. That happened with a woman who was ready to allow her family to fall apart. Her husband was gonna take her son and leave. And she was devastated and on medication for, for depression. And she thought there was no hope. And what was the depressive medication doing? I mean, I know about these things. And I worked in support for mental health for four years. I spent four years with, you know, trying to help people to understand 
there is something else. There's another way of looking at this. At that time, I didn't know if I had had the tools I have now and I was that young, then I would be ready to go all over again here. And that's the truth. Because right now, if you show a person those seven links, it opens the world to them. We're not saying stop, take the medication, stop taking it. We're not saying stop taking the meditation. We're saying find yourself in a, a, a psychologist or psychiatrist that is flexible enough to work with you very closely to understand what? Dependent origination from Buddhism? No. Human cognition. Human cognition is what dependent origination is. And this is exciting. This is really exciting. You take this and you couple it with what happened about 12 or 15 years back. And I hate to say it, we should have heard about this much sooner, but only now, 10 or 15 years after they've figured this out, is this coming out in, uh, you know, routinely on the internet or in articles or being talked about. And what am I talking about? Neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, the flexibility of our brain, the ability of our brain to rebuild itself, but not by itself. I have to be involved. <laughs> I have to be involved in changing a habitual tendency to go over here and think of nothing except how I feel bad, how I'm tired, how I'm exhausted, how everything hurts. Or I come over here and whip up a class and start teaching a class to you guys. <laughs> you see? This is the way this works. The neuroplasticity research, what it did it, and I, I don't know why it didn't get every award in the whole wide world, because it told the human race, you are not stuck anymore in the way that you do things. You have the potential to change. This is an unbelievable message. If you could understand how the depressive disorder wounds a person, and is only the beginning diagnosis. Before the depression came the tension, then the stress disorder hit. Stress disorder usually is the number one diagnosis. Then a depression is laid upon you. After the depression is laid upon you, then you have the tendency for panic attacks because you wanna get away from people. You don't wanna bother anybody around you because you're depressed. So what do you do? You get agoraphobic. That means you want to go away from people and leave the room and go in your own room, lie down, take a pill, cry yourself to sleep and stay away from people because that way you won't bother anybody. The unfortunate thing, I'll tell you this so that you understand something about depressive disorders is that it's not like you have a broken leg or you have a stomach disorder or even cancer. It, these are labeled, labeled diseases we can point to. The problem with uh, the, the way they're treated is to help you feel better in relationship to them. But this one is, is wicked because the depressive disorder has the added thing it's looked upon more important to have you not bother anybody around you than to heal you. That's the way it feels to the person with the depression. This is what is so hard about this. And all the, drug, the drugs try to stabilize us. There is nothing wrong with stabilizing a person when they're heavily depressed. This is where the drugs come in stabilize the person to be able to hear the knowledge and learn the knowledge and compute the knowledge in their mind and start looking at all of this differently. There is nothing wrong with the stabilization drugs. But when we are looking at the drugs where we get on them for the rest of our lives, that's where we have to be more careful. 
and there are we cannot make a blanket statement ever about depression. Why? Because there's such a variation of depressions. You see, you're not. It, it's like cancer. I solved cancers. Cancer is cured. I remember the article when I was working at a hospital once, and they came running and said they cured brain cancer. Okay. Which one was my, my remark? And they, what do you mean? There's 41 different brain cancers. <laughs> Just brain cancers, you know? Something like 41 different ones. Which one did you fix? I mean, it's not that I'm not happy. I'm happy you fixed one. Yeah, but to say we, we cured cancer, no, doesn't work that way, unfortunately. It doesn't work that way. So coming way back from where I was, I, I went away. How far away did I go, May? <laughs> I went, I went, oh, she's got mountains. I went around the mountain there for a while. Okay, so doing one more time, the instructions, and then you have the second one was the, the, uh, the uh, dis, 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 uh, what is it? Distractions, right? Then you had the path. And then you had Satipatthana. We don't, we don't want to forget to look at that, to clarify it. Then you have dependent origination. Then you have the anatta. So here we are at anatta. This is where this sutta I'm reading you now, 141, it becomes exciting, okay? Because 148 is like breathtaking. This one is fun because it shows you how he tried to make sure he included everything. But 148, he gave you the drills and he gave you the actual scene of those monks sitting around him and asking him, well, why do we have this problem? How did we get this problem? Well, what do we do now? And then he tells them what to do now precisely. And then he shows them how to change. And all of that is tied into neuroplasticity, because what he's telling them to do is to go out tomorrow and start practicing every step you take, every breath you do, every pause you have in your life. And remember, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just where I am. This is just what I'm doing in the present time. And see what happens if you leave the past thoughts about anything from the past and thoughts about anything from the future, you just clear the deck in the morning. You can take a deck of cards, cut it in half and say, this half is my past and this half is my future. Leave it on the table at home and go out to work for one day. And while you're out to work for one day, don't do anything that you're not right there in the present time. Acknowledge that you're in the present time. Forget about the present moment. I don't want you to come tell me that I gave you a headache. You can't get into the present moment. The guy told me that he had a headache because he kept trying to do that. I said, why'd you do that? I told you to take your watch off. Give me your watch. <laughs> He's trying to say in the present moment, 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 moment. Oh, that's ridiculous, ridiculous. It was Eckhart Tolle and it was a great big marketing campaign and whoopie doo. <laughs> but nobody can stay in the present moment. Why? Because of cousin who? Anicca, Anicca. <laughs> cousin Anicca is with us always. Changing, 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 changing. So we may as well welcome her or him in because he's not gonna go away. Everything is changing all the time. You want to say it's changing for the bad. Well, you don't know until afterwards. You don't know until you decide what you're going to make of it. I remember once I was living in a, in a hut with a dirt floor. Yeah. And somebody said, why do you sweep every day? <laughs> I sweep because I sweep every day. It was a mud floor and I sweep every day. Yep. But that was the floor that was there. So we just do it routinely. Why do you wash the walls? Well, I wash the walls with cow urine because if I wash the, the walls with the cow urine, then none of the mosquitoes come in. 
but it smells bad. Well, it will for a day or so, but then it, it's gone and so are the mosquitoes gone. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Yeah. I went to a place in India once where I had the opportunity to throw cow flops on the side of a building. <laughs> it was really a wonderful thing because then they wash them all down. They take them all off afterwards and it's soaked into the plaster and no mosquitoes, no fans, no electricity. In their, in their case, there was no electricity, but everybody's fine, everybody's fine. See, so what do you make of it? It depends on what you do, what you decide. So we're in charge, in charge of this boat that's floating through the whole system, the whole ocean of life. We are floating along and we are steering. And guess what? Our parents are not going to come up and start steering anymore. At some point, they're not going to be there and you're steering. So what is this whole lesson the Buddha is teaching us as we go through this? It's going to be that you are going to learn how powerful you are. You're going to reclaim your personal power. I decide what I see. What I see, you, you see something else. In an accident on the corner, four of us on four corners, we cannot testify in court in the United States if the four of us are on four corners watching an accident because we'll be there forever <laughs> because we have four separate opinions as to what happened so it's up to you all right here we go at Veneers in Deer Park cultivate the friendship of Sariputta and Moggallana because Sariputta is the mother he's going to teach you how to sit how to do take care of the vinya how to learn the rules how to stand in line, what time to get up and go on alms, how to clean your cootie. He's going to teach you everything. And he's going to teach you and support you for the first four jhanas. At the fourth jhana, he's going to turn you over to Mogalana. Mogalana is the nurse. Mogalana, nurses only come in, you know, a couple times a day when you're in the hospital. They don't come in there all the time. Your mother might be there, but, <laughs> but, but Mogalana is only going to come in if you ask him specifically to. They are wise, they are helpful to their companions in the holy life. Sariputta is the mother, Mogalana is the nurse. Sariputta trains the others for the fruit of stream entry. There you are, up to the point of the stream entry and Mogalana for the supreme goal for the rest of it. Uh, he teaches you up to fourth jhana and they say stream entry, is uh, sotapanna, okay, but it can happen if you're just listening to the Buddha teach you the sutta, it can happen that way very quickly, or it can happen the regular way it does inside your practice. Moggallana for the supreme goal. Sariputta Bhikkhus is able to announce, to teach, describe, establish, reveal, expound, and exhibit the Four Noble Truths. So the Blessed One said, and having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Uh-oh, here we go again. <laughs> he keeps leaving. And these monks, they keep letting him leave. And they're not supposed to be doing that. Soon after the Blessed One had gone, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus, friends, bhikkhus, Friend, the bhikkhus replied to the Sari, Venerable Sariputta, and Venerable Sariputta said this, at Benares, in the deer park, at Isipatana, the Tathagata, he accomplished and fully enlightened and set rolling the matchless wheel of Dhamma, exhibiting everything and the four noble truths. And what four did he talk about? The announcing, the exhibiting of the noble truth of suffering. The announcing and exhibiting of the noble truth of origin of suffering. The announcing and exhibiting of the noble truth of cessation of suffering. The, the announcing and exhibiting of the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And what, friends, is the noble truth of suffering? Okay, now this is what's funny about this one point here <laughs> is we would talk about the definition of suffering. Bhante said to us always, you know, we can never use the word you are trying to define in the definition of that word. 
So the Buddha didn't know that. <laughs> so listen carefully. And what, friends, is the noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one once is suffering, and in short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. Now, remember something here. This is one of the slippage points. Five aggregates. You as a being have a body from your head to your toes, body. You have feeling. Just remember three kinds, pleasant, painful, or neutral. Perception. Perception perceives. Perception names things, okay? Thoughts arise in your mind just the way the eye sees a sight. Well, a thought pops up in the mind. This is the, the mind and mind object game, okay? And consciousness, consciousness cognizes. To cognize something is to understand it, deeply understand it, okay? Now, what's important, the reason I point this out to you is five aggregates are suffering when they are affected by clinging. Always remember this. You are not a bowl of suffering. These five things you are as a being, five aggregates don't suffer. And you're going to get fights from monks and a lot of people if you start saying this correctly, but the five aggregates are not suffering. The five aggregates when affected by clinging or if affected by clinging are suffering. Always remember this. And what, friends, is birth? the birth of beings into the various orders of beings. They're coming to their birth, precipitation in the womb, generation, the manifestation of the aggregates, obtaining the basis for the contact. This is called the birth. When the being comes into existence, the contact basis form in the body and they come into being as well, okay? And what, friends, is aging? The aging of beings is the various orders of beings, their old age, brokenness of teeth, grayness of hair, wrinkling of skin, decline of life, weakness of faculties. This is called aging. Now, these two sections, 11 and 12, okay, when we're talking about this, Remember, they're talking and describing this in terms of the 12 links in terms of a human being, okay? But what the Buddha, the deepest understanding of the Dhamma that you can have is understanding he wanted you to understand the origination, the disappearance, the personal involvement, the danger of that, and the escape from all phenomena that arise in the mind. And what I should have said to you before, but somehow I think I didn't quite get there, is that when, um, when the person, oh, that just jumped out of my mind. I hate it when it does that. Probably jumped out of that ear somewhere right there. <laughs> Went right out. Um, let me see if I can find it. Hmm. I hate it when I do a blank like that. It's all right. It'll come back. It, uh, the uh, the uh, what is the the uh, origination, the disappearance, the gratification, danger, and escape. That is what you are. Yeah, the, the origination, the the origination and the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape is what you're observing. This is your mindfulness. That's your observation. That is what you are trying to see. How this works impersonally operates. And so this is how you see the connection of this whole thing. Um, but there was another one, Bhante, and I can't pin it down. It'll come back because I know I skipped it. What, what, friends, is death? Oh, I know what it was. Wait. Okay, I got it. Okay. When they're talking to you in reference to the 12 links, they're almost always talking to you about human being. But because 
what you're trying to learn, that little capsule I just gave you, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of a rising phenomena, okay? When, when you are looking at that, you're looking at uh, the operation of the human being in a much deeper place. So what the, what the Buddha actually did was he changed this subject object thing. This is where it was, Bunty, okay? He changed the subject object approach to meditation, which everybody was doing everywhere. I am the subject and I have an object. And he says, that's not the answer. And what he figures out when he, when he figured out what was missing, the, the little gong that goes off in your head or the bell rings, was when he realized the subject is the object. And then what happened? When, what if the subject was the object and there was no object? Okay, now watch what happens. If the subject is the object, where do you go? You go to the mind because mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. All the states happen here. A whole entire operation of your entire body happens from here. The brain is not just responsible for what we're talking about here in the mind. When we say mind and brain are sort of synonymous here, okay? But we're saying that the operation of the entire being is happening from here in the brain is doing that. So when he did that, he changed the, it was a game changer because you're no longer looking outside, you're looking inside. And he discovers something. The only way out of this suffering is in, is to go into where it's first coming from where it actually begins. And this is the connection with the mind and the brain research that's being done in neuro neuroplasticity. This is what this is. Okay. What friends is death? It is the passing away. It is the dying of the being, the completion of the time, the dissolution of the aggregates, the laying down of the body. This is called death for the human being. In when you start putting the um, lenses onto the microscope and you're going deeper and deeper and deeper and you go move over to the electron microscope, you're able to see very deeply beyond the external body, but into the whole being of how everything is operating. That's what gets exciting about what he did. And what, friends, is the sorrow? The sorrow, the sorrowing, the sorrowfulness, the inner sorrow, the inner sorriness of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. That is what is called the sorrow, the sorrow. And what, friends, is lamentation? The lamentation is the wail, the lament, the wailing and lamenting, the bewailing and lamentation of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. And this is called sorrow. And what, friends, is pain? Bodily pain, bodily discomfort, uncomfortable feeling born of bodily contact. This is called the pain. And what friends is grief, mental pain, mental discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling born of mental contact. This is called grief. And so he divides bodily pain from mental pain, doesn't he? So he's looking at the whole scope of the operation of the being. And what, friends, is despair? The trouble and despair, the tribulation, desperation of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state. And this is called the despair. And what, friends, now here comes the capsule description of your suffering. What, friends, is not to obtain what one once is suffering? To being subject to birth, there comes the wish, oh, that uh, we were not subject to birth. 
the birth would not come to us. But this is not to be obtained by wishing and not to obtain what one wants is suffering to being subject to aging or subject to sickness or subject to death or sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. There comes the wish, oh, that we were not subject to this sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair would not come to us. But this is not to be obtained by wishing. So he's saying, stop this wishing. Stop this pause, great causal thing we're caught in today of wishing, I like this one, wishing we could change this world, wishing we could make this world be what we want it to be. But do you know something? I'll tell you a secret. We don't have to wait for somebody to tell us how to do that. Why? Because we can do it tomorrow. If everyone understood the power they have, there isn't one person I know that doesn't have a vision of the fix. In other words, a vision of what it would be like if we changed the world and it was changed. But what do we do with it? We put it inside. We hold it inside. We don't live it. We will talk here today. We will do this lesson and another lesson and another lesson. But how many of us will actually go out and embrace the population or the action in the store or pick up the bag when the woman drops it or walk by and ignore it when the woman can't cross the street by herself? How many people will go out and get the old man and help him to get to the other side of the street because the light turned? You see, this is all these things we know we should do, we don't do. So is it really, we can't say it's up to the politicians. I think we all mostly gave up on that. But it would say blame on us. We want another system. We don't know what system. We know what didn't work before. But here we all sit. And we know inside how we want this to be. How you want to treat me. How I want to treat you. Then why don't we do it? Because we're stuck taking everything so personally. We are so busy and habitually being wounded, we can't seem to do it. And yet there it is. We could change it all tomorrow. Yeah. There was a song, an old song. Um, you should look this guy up. His name was, um, right, that's good. I'm going to lose this one. Um, he sang social change songs, okay? And some of the songs he, he has, uh, you know, are they just force you to look at the problem. You don't want to look at the problem. So all the songs are social change songs. And um, one of the ones was, you should be nice to everybody. You should be good to everybody. Why? Because I might be the one. I might be the one who can change all the world forever. You might be the one, you might be the one who can end all the war forever. And then he gives this whole song about it, right? He tried to make us laugh when during the Cold War. He tried really hard to make us look closely at the problem. One of the things we looked at were the instruction manuals that we were given in case they were going to push the button and make the bomb go off. This is how we lived back then, the 60s and 70s, right? In the, and I think it was in the, probably in the 80s that I um, heard him the first time. And um, He did one for Russia outside of Moscow, and he showed us, um, he actually had a picture of the pamphlet they're given in, we're in Moscow, where if we're going to send the bomb over, they have to immediately get their, get their brochure out and immediately take care of this. And the idea was to um, dig a hole in the ground and climb on down. Put some boards above you and then sprinkle dirt around. You don't have to be dead 
if you only plan ahead, just remember, keep a shovel in the shed. That was the chorus for the song. <laughs> and it was trying to make you look at the ridiculousness of trying to do anything when in 15 minutes, everything was going to be gone. We are a remarkable species, human beings. We can manage to laugh and it releases us, it releases us. We need to keep laughing. It's better we laugh than pick up a gun. We have to look at what our situation is and understand that when we're looking at how everything works, like with what the Buddha figured out, then we have to apply it, go out and embrace people, go out and get involved actually go sit on a park bench and face the people that are walking towards you and see what happens if you sit there and go nothing but what happens if you sit there and you're smiling and you just close your eyes and you keep smiling and you just are smiling and everybody's walking towards you there'll be a group of people that will stand within six feet of you and they'll be looking at you wondering what the heck is going on Bonte told us about this. We tried it. We did it at the mall in Washington, D.C. It works. It's really fun. You never know what will happen. People are not likely to come at you if you smile and just go and do. You'd be amazed at what happens. Let's keep going. What friends are the five aggregates affected by clinging? In short, are suffering. They are the material form aggregate affected by clinging. Now remember, every single sentence has this, affected by clinging. The feeling aggregate affected by clinging. Perception aggregate affected by clinging. Formations aggregate affected by clinging. Consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. These are the five aggregates affected by clinging. And in short, they are suffering. This is called the noble truth of suffering. So this is looking at number two, the noble truth of what is this suffering? And number three, the noble truth, the third one, what friends is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering? It is the, re watch carefully, the remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering, not the momentary one, okay? It is the remainderless fading away and ceasing, the giving up, the relinquishing, letting go, the rejecting of that same craving. What is the craving? You know what the craving is? The craving is... I don't like this feeling. I like this feeling. I want this feeling. I've got to get attached to it. That's the first one. I don't like this feeling. I don't want this feeling. I want to make it stop. Revolves around two of them, doesn't it? I want to make it stop. It's a denial of truth. This is suffering, this, uh, this craving. Craving is special because he figured out that craving always manifests. It always shows up. You can learn, that means you can detect it. And it shows up as tension and tightness in the mind and the body. Now it can be anywhere in the body. Doesn't mean you stop and have a body scan, okay? You don't need to do that. Just get a little sensitive to watch where the moment I say something for the fifth time that you don't want to hear again, <laughs> you go uh, like this uh, before you don't like it. How do I make this stop? And so you're learning a detection system when we say that you you know, you, uh, you see the origination of it, how it comes up, the disappearances will go away by itself. That's something we forget about because of Cousin Anicca, insignificant little person, but and Cousin Anicca has a great job. She just makes everything disappear. <laughs> Doesn't have to face anything because it keeps changing, changing, changing. Anicca. The Anicca story. We never get over the Anicca story with the taxi cab, will we? 
<laughs> the taxi cab. Okay, we're not going there today. What is the noble uh, cessation of the suffering? The trick to this is this: they're talking the arahat here now. The arahat remainderless. There's no remainder at all. Remainderless fading away and ceasing. The giving up, relinquishing, and letting go, rejecting the same craving. That's the noble truth of the cessation of the suffering, is letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. It's amazing. What, friends, is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering? Now we go into the Eightfold Path. And it is this right view, right intention, right speech right action, then right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Now, that's the traditional right, wrong, right, wrong. <laughs> we didn't like that. Bhante didn't like it. It all made us all kind of feel, um, why can't we change this? So what are we really after? Many of us were musical, involved in the beginning. And harmony, harmony is what we want. We remember a peace and harmony day in the mid, middle, uh, middle security prison in Lorton, south of Washington, DC. Peace and harmony day. And it was a good, a good peace and harmony day. We had a good time, but the weekend, after the weekend, I called up there to see how everybody was doing, talked to this one guy and uh, he said, yeah, it was okay. It was a good day. Everything went well until you sang over the rainbow. I said, well, what, what's wrong with singing over the rainbow? <laughs> he said, well, somebody went over the wall. <laughs> they left, they went and they are in, I couldn't talk to him because he's in solitary confinement. I said, what do you mean? He said, he took it literally, sister. He took it literally, just wanted to leave. So he decided to climb over the wall. And he said, it's a terrible thing. And he kept going on, it's terrible, terrible. I said, well, you can say it's terrible, but the truth of the matter is, look at it this way. He has a very, very quiet place to meditate for a while. If he will just, you know, use his meditation a little bit, somebody can slip him a note. He needs to sit and he needs to clear his mind and stay inside the wall. Tell him that from me. <laughs> He shouldn't go outside the wall. But how did I know Judy Garland's song would have such an effect? <laughs> anyway, what friends, we call this harmonious perspective, right view. The view is your view is how you take things immediately. That's how we, how we take it immediately. Upon first seeing or hearing it, how do we take it immediately? Knowledge of suffering, uh, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is right view. And when you learn these four noble truths, they help you to reflect how would this all be different? I'm not saying to you, you should believe me and you should absolutely just say everything's in person. I'm saying, go test it, <laughs> play with it for a week, go and test it. I don't care if you believe what I tell you or not. It's not that I don't love you or I don't like you. It's that I can only give you what I'm telling you is real from my own experience, but also encourage you to test everything that we're doing. I don't know if you guys have heard this. I don't know how many of you have been in this, um, you know, in retreat with, um, done, done an online retreat or what you guys have done. But one of the things we put back in here that um, we had taken it out for a while and it should be in the front, but somehow it's not. Here we go is Kalama Sutta. Kalama Sutta is a really important sutta. And sometimes they teach, it's a funny thing, these suttas, sometimes people teach this part of it or that part of it. And they say, this is what it's about. That's what it's about. The most important part in Kalama Sutta, really, I believe Bhante and, and um, you know, uh, his teacher, Usulananda, I think they were right on target. 
And the two of them sat down and they wrote this for the translation for the Kalama Sutta. Listen carefully. It is unwise to simply believe what you hear because it has been said over and over again for a long time. It is unwise to follow tradition blindly because it has just been practiced in the same way for a long time. It is unwise to listen to and spread rumors and gossip. It is unwise to take anything as being the absolute truth just because it agrees with one's scriptures without practicing to see through direct experience if they are true or not. It is unwise to foolishly make assumptions without honest investigation to see if they are correct or not. It is unwise to go by mere outward appearance or to hold too tightly onto any view or idea because one is comfortable with it. It is unwise to be convinced of anything out of respect or deference to one spiritual teacher without first practicing and investigating what is being taught. It may be a good idea for all of us to go beyond our own opinions and beliefs and dogmatic thinking. In this way, we can rightly reject anything which when accepted and practiced and perfected, it leads to more anger and criticism and conceit and frustration, pride, greed, or delusion. These unwholesome states of mind are universally condemned and are certainly not beneficial to ourselves or to others. These unskillful ways of acting and thinking are best to be avoided whenever possible. But on the other hand, we can rightly accept anything which when practiced and perfected, it leads to unconditional love, contentment and soft wisdom. These things allow us to develop a happy, tranquil, and peaceful mind. Thus, the wise praise all kinds of unconditional love, loving acceptance of the present moment, tranquility, contentment, and gentle wisdom. And they encourage everyone to practice these uplifting qualities as much as possible. They took this and put it together. This was about, I think, three, three years, maybe before uh, Usulananda died in 2005. This is probably way early, the first, first or second time we went out to California. So basically it's common sense, but these are things we need to stitch in embroidery. These are things we need to sketch on a piece of paper um, once I said, Bonte, what are you doing? He said, I got you this big poster board. What's it for? He said, I want you to write. Um, let's see, what was it? May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy 5,000 times on the back of this board. Then, then what we do is we'll do a string art on the front of the board and cover it up. It'll become a holy relic and we'll put it in the temple. I love this. We never finished this. I have to tell you the truth. Three or four of us worked on it, but we never ever got it finished. Makes me think I should start one now maybe, and I should try to do it. <laughs> but it's so tiny. We had to do it so tiny, you know, to get it on the back of this poster board. But this is the kind of thing that they did in the temples, the kind of things they drilled the, the practices. And someone said, oh, it's such a shame. You know, they have to give up being an artist if they're a monk. D don't kid yourself. OK, stop, stop, stop. You know, it's like, you know, I saw the monks in, in uh, Florida work so hard. You would not believe how hard when they when they they bought a piece of property next to the temple with three houses on it. And they gutted the inside of those houses, restructured them completely, imported monks from here and there. The Thai monks have got to be the most organized 
sensible monks in modern times in Theravada system. You know, because they bring them in the plumber, they bring in the wool maker, they bring in the bricklayer, they bring in the stone man, they gutted the inside of the temple. This was their, this was their methodical, repetitive, repetitious training of this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, this is a brick. <laughs> this is, a, we're going to do the whole entire thing. You see, there's so many ways that we can practice this if we bring it into our lives and actually embrace it into everything that you do. So let's see where else we go with imaging is imaging, uh, harmonious imaging is right intention is right, been turned into right thought many times. And imaging is you, we look at it and say the harm, you're the one that's responsible for keeping the harmonious image in your mind all the time. What you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind. Inclination is intention running into action and actually happening. So that's where it all starts. So the seed for changing the world is inside each of you, you see? So then we have harmonious communication. Well, harmonious communication had to be communication instead of right speech, because why? Well. Bonte grew up in a family of six boys and one girl, <laughs> and I had five children. So it was easy to identify harmonious communication was more than just talking. When your mother is standing on the back porch saying, it is time to come in for dinner, you hear the mother's voice, you know, you know, so there's the sound and action and touching and everything is all communication. And giving a gift is communication or a bribe. Look at it either way with your parents, <laughs> you know, but this is what's going on. <clears throat> it's all communication. Then you have a harmonious movement of mind's attention. Well, right action Right action, of course, right action is abstaining from killing living beings and keeping the precepts. But action, where does it all begin? It begins here in the mind. Harmonious movement of mind's attention. Whatever is happening in any situation where you have to make a decision to abstain from killing, abstain from taking what is not given, abstain from misconduct, those things, that's where it starts. It starts in your mind. So go to the source. Bhante. That's what the Buddha is saying. Go to the source of this whole thing and we'll find the whole answer. And then harmonious lifestyle. Lifestyle. How do you set up your Livingston. Now, when we were looking at this, after we did this, we, we built this early, it was the early part, um, like first five years, 2000 to 2005 or so. But I had a lot of opportunity over the years to look at the lifestyle or way that a person sets up their life to be able to be a Buddhist, to be able to have space to practice, to worship, to pay homage to the Buddha to give gifts to the Buddha, a place. What does it really mean, you know, to set up a lifestyle? Livelihood was simple. You simply abandon any wrong livelihood of selling human beings or making missiles and weapons or poisons or things like that. That was your livelihood, but you will naturally give up wrong livelihood if you are keeping all your precepts. This is something that's really true. You think about that. You're not going to violate that. But if we turn this into the lifestyle, I've been in a place where there were two rooms and it was a tiny, tiny, tiny farm with eight or nine little goats. They had a baby goat and the grandfather, they asked me, they brought me there for lunch to have a meal. And they, they had changed the way the room was set up and they they didn't really have a kitchen, but they made the kitchen the other room for this day. She had to walk about, I don't know, maybe 100, 200 feet to get a bucket of water to bring it back to the house. They didn't have any running water. They had outside a toilet, outside like in a little hut, like we would have an outhouse um, at, the, at the mountain, okay? 
um, they had six people living in this arrangement, okay? And the grandfather, he had his baby goats. And he and I, when I saw the baby goat and he saw my face, I went and sat down on the couch and was uh, the mother gave me some tea and I put my tea down and he brought a baby goat in and put it on my lap. <laughs> and I thought this was perfect. This was absolutely perfect. He gave me this little baby goat had just been born, was just dried off. And he, oh, was so cute and suck, suck, suck on my finger, you know. And this was to him. He saw my face light up. And he was so happy. I dare say there are not a lot of nuns who would go in this place to begin with. <laughs> Maybe I'm not sure, but I'm, I don't know. But I was going just everywhere. And I, to me, that was the best place I ever went to have a meal was in this tiny little place in the middle of a field uh, with uh, very few other houses around where they were with the chickens outside and the goats and one cow. And just this is like a little miniature heaven, but it was a very difficult life, very hard, but they were very, very happy just to be able to feed me and just to be able to have a translator sit there and tell them a story and give them basic thing, their precepts together as a family. And this is the kind of thing that I did for the period of time I was in, uh, in, um, in, um, right, good. I was there. <laughs> this was, I can't remember what, the first place I went to and I can't, re it won't come to me right now. But the, but the, um, the people were very special because they could take me anywhere. And I was totally flexible. Now I probably couldn't even walk there, but, but anyway, that was another time. So the next one is right effort. Right effort is special because right effort is what you practice. And right effort is a systematic repetitions form of practicing uh, the, the, uh, the neural cognitive changes in your mind. You are systematically training your mind. It has two parts. It has... It has the uh, standard description, which I'll read it to you. And then these four steps and our six steps are in these four steps. And I'll show you how. So what friends is right effort? When um, a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states, he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. Okay, and when he does that, he he is letting go. He is recognizing there. He's seeing this. He's seeing this piece. Okay, that the um, and he makes an effort to see it clearly. Rings energy up, exerts his mind, and he keeps an eye constantly keeps an eye out on this. Then he awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of the arisen evil unwholesome state makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. So strive means you actually do it, okay, each time. And the zeal means enthusiasm. We took away zeal and just said it's enthusiasm. And at each time you let it go, and then you should relax your, your mind. And because anytime you're practicing any form of meditation or drill, you should be relaxing your mind, letting go and relaxing. He, then he awakens the uh, zeal for the arising of the unarisen wholesome state. So once he lets it go, he brings up a wholesome state to take the place of the unwholesome state. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And then he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-appearance, the strengthening, the increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states, and he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. So this keeps repeating this each time. Now, one of the things we figured out about this is in the text in different books, the statement is always written the same precise way, but you have two things going on. You have one is effort and the other um, is, I'm sorry, right? What did I do there? Right. One is doing your um, right, your right, right effort. And the other one is right striving. 
So what's the difference between effort and striving? Because we have this, this, these two things explained in exactly the same wording and the same paragraph every single time throughout the text. And Polly, we did some research on this. And But what is the difference here, we think, is we've witnessed in our students, if you will just take the practice and do it for about two months, and this matches the research they did in the neurocognitive uh, research. They said that the habit can be changed within 63 days. So our students are running 60 to 65 days. If they're doing this systematically with everything that arises, they let it go, they relax, they bring up the wholesome and they keep that going. They're giving that message to the brain until the brain gets it that's when it becomes striving. So why would we say this this way? Well, we had the, the giveaway in the, um, the giveaway is when you're talking in the Eightfold Path, you're talking about, um, I'm sorry, the 37 requisites of enlightenment. The Eightfold Path is one of those 37 requisites of enlightenment, but there's two other ones. And one of them is called, um, May give it to me. What is it? Right, um, right effort. Right. No, I'm sorry. Um, the five faculties. Five faculties. Five faculties, and you have five powers. And the question the student will always ask is, why are we repeating the five faculties again and calling them five powers? And what the senior monks? Uh, I asked a lot of the oldest monks I could find. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was in Singapore and different places, and I'd ask them the question. And faculties, you have to pay attention to faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and, um, and wisdom, okay? This is what you have to pay attention to, okay? Uh, but then five powers, you don't have to pay attention to them anymore. They're automatic. Your mind is starting to balance. You surrendered your faith and said, this is definitely the practice. I know it is, I can feel it, it's progressing, it's making progress, it's no joke. This is something real, it's where you're saying you're surrendering your faith. Your energy is automatically balancing itself. Mindfulness is your observation. Um, and then the uh, concentration level and the wisdom, you know, your, your mind is starting to do it automatically. So we looked at that and we said, well, look, you know, this is even more obvious the same way when we find these paragraphs throughout the text all over the place. We can say that striving is right effort and it's happening automatically. So then we started fishing around with students and started questioning people. How long have you been doing this? You know, how long did it take you to get there? And we started having more students come to us and say, you know, this is something special. Uh, because it's happening automatically at about 60 days. And then we found the research and it matches up. So that's it. Okay. Then the last part of this, this sutta that we're, we're going to zip through really fast is basically um, observation uh, is with, with us. What we want you to just remember, op your observation power is your mindfulness. Here, the monk abides contemplating body as body. Now, here we are, body as body, not me, not mine, not myself. Ardent, fully aware, mindful, having put away desire and aversion uh, for the world. He abides contemplating feeling as feeling. Um, and he abides, uh, okay, contemplating mind as mind and contemplating mind objects as mind objects. So here we are back at Satipatthana, restating Satipatthana inside the Eightfold Path. You're just putting a stamp on it all over again. And the next one is right concentration. We say collectedness of mind. Why? Because we're trying to get you to soften down and always remember that concentration traditionally in modern times meant concentrate like this. And it meant make a point and concentrate really hard. And we want you to constant, to have a collectedness of mind that has an open vision inside. When you watch inside, you have a vision uh, area that is the same as outside. 
so that you have even peripheral vision to the sides. You can notice when your mind, when your eyes are closed and you you're you're practicing, you can see something come from here, from the side, come up and go across. It doesn't always stay in this area here. It can come from the right or the left side. See, it's all it's about is your peripheral vision. Quite secluded from central pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, the monk abides and, and, and enters in the first jhana, accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence. And this confidence is really important to raise up this confidence. And the, the right effort seems to be very strong in helping the person's confidence to believe this is going to work. If I keep repeating this, you get what? You have um, immediate results and invitation to look deeper into this. And your self-confidence, singleness of mind without this, the thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born from a balanced concentration or a collectedness of mind <clears throat> with the fading away as well of joy. The, um, the person abides in equanimity and mindful is mindful and still fully aware. So again, this is, con this is confirming 111 that you still have feeling pleasure in the body. <clears throat> he enters upon and abides in the third jhana on account of which the noble ones announced. He has a pleasant abiding, has equanimity and is mindful. And with the abandonment of this pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he's entering upon and abides in the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness that is due to the equanimity. And this is called right concentration. So they're giving you a pretty good picture of right balance of concentration. And I always point out that in the Vasudhimaga, in the very first page about concentration, there is a statement you have to develop for, for our purposes, it says, for our purposes in the Vasudhimaga. For our purposes of practice and discussing concentration, it must be a profitable level of concentration. So what is profitable level of concentration? A level of concentration that will allow us and support us to reach path. That is what a level of uh, concentration is. This is called the noble truth in the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So at Benares, friend, in the deer park at Itsipatana, the Tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened. He set rolling the matchless wheel of the Dhamma, which cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahmin or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in this world. And that is the announcing, the teaching, the describing, the establishing, the revealing, the expounding and the exhibiting of these four noble truths. And I hope that we have announced and taught and described and established and revealed and expelled and exhibited um, the, the four noble truths. So these four noble truths are a really important part of this capsule that we're talking about all the time, okay? So I'm going to throw this open. Uh, this is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The bhikkhus were satisfied, delighted with the Venerable Sariputta's words. And um, the jhana levels, as you're going through the jhana levels, this is one thing uh, that I, I agree with that is, is um, being talked about now, is you are decreasing the atta systematically decreasing atta as you are going through your jhanas and you're increasing the anatta perspective. So your level of understanding is coming stronger and stronger and more and more stable as you're going through the jhanas. Anybody has any questions? I know we've probably gone way over time, but you know what? They took my clock away. So I've been, I've been suspended in midair. Anybody have a question they want to throw up? <laughs> One question. Yes. 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Venerable Kema. Um, I have one question. Uh, when you were explaining, um, well, I feel you said eight aspects or very important parts. Uh, I got instructions, the five hindrances or distractions, the path, the, the four establishments of mindfulness, Satipatthana, dependent mm -hmm. origination, and Anatta. After, oh. after that, mm, yeah. I also grow down, but not sure after this point, I also yeah, grow I... down Anicca and personal power, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, anything else is. Uh, yeah, easy. yeah, yeah. I see what you're doing. Okay. Um, the the um, let's see what we have here. Okay. We say the instructions is the first one. The second one is discussing very strongly and very clearly how to handle the um, the uh, hindrances. And then the third one is understanding. Uh, path, or we understanding the jhanas or path knowledge, we say, okay, and then uh, the fifth one is understand, uh, under, I'm sorry, fourth one is uh, boosting by retuning the terminology for the four foundations of mindfulness, that's from Satipatthana, and then number five is understanding dependent origination, that's the 12 links and the seven links, the whole thing, okay, and then the sixth one is understanding the impersonal nature of self, of every nature of everything. And that's the anatta, okay? Um, and then um, in seven, after we do the anatta, we, what we usually do in the, in the, um, in the retreats themselves, we're interviewing the, pra the practitioner, we're interviewing the student every day, which is a little different than some retreats. But because we're interviewing them every day, we're in, we're, there is a link between us and our students. We try not to book any more than 30 in, in a retreat because of this, because we want this connection between the teacher and the student. Okay, and what this is about is that steers us what we're gonna do on day seven and on day eight. So on day seven, a lot of times we will choose uh, one, of, um, one of three suttas. There are three suttas. One is uh, MN 43, that's the Mahavidala Sutta. These are question and answer suttas. One is uh, uh, MN 44, that's the Dhammadina uh, Sutta where the nun was giving the answers. Chula, that's the Chula Vidala Sutta. And then the other one is sometimes we'll take 51 and 53. And those two suttas, I don't have the names for them right here for you, but it's number 51 and number 53. And we will weave those two together to look into the states for the disciple in higher training, it, it's, it has a good breakdown of uh, the, in detail of some of the things that we discuss in the front part of the retreat, okay? And then in day eight, the, um, we're talking to you about how the, uh, the Buddha teaches his Dhamma, and so we might take, I can give you the numbers, but uh, we use certain suttas that, for instance, number 95 is Chanki Sutta, and that one gives you the 12 steps for perfecting the student's success in the practice. It's a student-teacher relationship discussion is what it is. And then 105 is Sunakata Sutta is, um, important because you want to be able to identify when you are making an overestimation of your progress so that you don't get caught up in thinking, you, you start to think I'm this far along. You want to keep your mind 
uh, open as much as possible, no matter what, how many times you manage to go through. When I talk about going through, I mean, where the mind opens, stops, everything stops, and you, you, you experience what's called a mundane form of nirvana, where your mind opens up, and it's kind of like um, rebooting a computer. <laughs> it's like restarting your computer when it doesn't work really smoothly. If I restart it, I turn it off, and everything shuts down. When I turn it back on again, it has a clean drive, and it has the factory settings again. And it was brought to my attention last year by some women that I was teaching that this is what's happening to them because when they come back on again, they have no thoughts of the past, no thoughts of the future. And for a period of time, and the period of time is up to you how well you take care of this state of mind when you are in that state of mind, your mind is very, very clear and very powerful and open, but it's how well can you take care of it and how long before you're falling back into thinking about the past and the future again. That's why there are all these degrees of, of progress that you can make with this thing. You look at the, uh, the other two suttas, let's see, I said 95, 105, 107, is Ganaka Mogalana. That's important. Ganaka Mogalana Sutta is important because it makes, it tries to help you understand uh, that the Buddha was, um, he was teaching a, um, in a, a specific way, he was teaching you a basis that had knowledge and that has an antidote. He was doing it again and again and again. He was showing you how the, how the suffering operates. And then he was showing you how to practice so that you can see it and how to let go of it. And then he was showing you the way out, the, the precise practice. In 140, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta is the exposition of the elements. Now we didn't do that one. To, is that the one we just did, right? The Datu Vibhanga, right? We just did 140, okay. And that's examining how the Buddha taught. Um, is that right? Wait a minute, let me see here. Something looks funny. I'm looking at something, something the wrong way. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. mm. I think that's a misprint. Oh no, 140 is the Potter Shed. Okay, Potter Shed. Potter Shed, um, the, the uh, Datu Vibhanga Sutta is the story of the Potter Shed. And the Potter Shed is, a, is an important story because it gives you um, almost the whole teaching in one night's training between the Buddha and, uh, and one student. And um, he's explaining to him how everything works. It's a, it's a really nice uh, sutta. And 62 is the Maha Rahulawada Sutta. The reason we use that one um, for this one, this is because the Buddha was instructing his son how important it was for him uh, to learn the Brahma Viharas as his primary meditation he was emphasizing it should be the primary meditation you're teaching to the people on a steady basis. And when he was teaching him this sutta, his son was 17 and he was about to go to another country and teach where the people were not very nice. And his father wanted him to be able to um, teach those people in a way where they would change and it would protect him. So there's a number of reasons why he would have given this to his son, but he's teaching him the importance of the Brahma Viharas. And that's why we teach you the Brahma Viharas because we don't see the breath meditation as a way of changing people's behavior and changing their way of, of behaving and, and working. We don't see these changes happening with that, um, but we see the, uh, the people getting restful and calming down very fast. And in any situation of an emergency, you would use the breathing meditation. That would be the one, like when the kids were in the cave and they were stuck in the cave in Thailand, 
what does he do? He has them sit down and do the breathing meditation. There were a couple of reasons too, because they needed the oxygen. And if they weren't afraid, they would have a lot more oxygen. So, but you know, the, but the breathing was a way of immediately calming everybody's fear down. But the Brahma Viharas is very specific. And when we're showing you, it's, it gives you something breath meditation does not give us. And it's emphasized again and again as a method that the metta will remove all thoughts of um, ill will and hatred. And that the, the, uh, the karuna, when it turns into the karuna, um, then all of a sudden there's no thoughts of, um, what's the next one? <laughs> Let's see, this, what is the um, and hatred, right? Gre I'm sorry, greed and hatred. Okay, takes away the thoughts of cruelty. And then the mudita is the internal uh, an overflowing of internal joy. And it is also the mudita is like uh, two ways of looking at it. It's empathetic joy where you're happy when someone else is happy or they've succeeded. You're, you're, you're so happy inside. Then the mudita, when that happens, uh, then what happens to you is that you don't have any thoughts of, um, these things are just leaving my head this morning. You don't have any thoughts of, um, help, may, <laughs> what is it? Thoughts of, uh, when you let go of the, you let, what's, what's, which one is it? Discontent, good, discontent. Yeah. This content probably uh, also yeah. like jealousy or envy or something like uh, that. Uh, that's the last one. When you when uh, you're practicing, uh, the last one is the equanimity. And when you're doing the equanimity, the upeka, no thoughts of aversion happen at all. So that would be your jealousy, your hate, you know, that all that stuff that falls in that way. You know that eliminates the jealousy and everything. You're exactly right. But what we liked about uh, we saw the people changing. I think uh, that the thing that made Vanti so happy, you know, after a retreat, what he would be really happy was that he's happy because you're happy. <laughs> Because you see the people change and we watch you change over a nine or 10 day period. I have research that's like from 12 years of research of keeping this all charted, like what happens to a person. But, but you know, the progress also should not be just looked at in, in reference to this part. It should also be looked at um, uh, very um, operatively in the m person's meditation, that the progress you make also is increasing the length of time that you're sitting gradually. And this was a gradual teaching. It was a gradual practice and a gradual progress. That's what you learned in, in Ganika Mogalana. Gradual teaching, gradual practice, gradual progress. And it isn't like a, an immediate there's the whole answer. It's not like that. And the emphasis the, the, in the Buddhist method of teaching that was so important too, is that he changed the relationship between the guru and the teacher before was when the guru tells you something, that's it. And you do it and no questions. And I, I had the opportunity in New York to ask some uh, young people that were um, the Brahmin teaching was being taught to them in their teenage years, the same exact way as it was back then, where when, the, how does the class work? We don't ask questions. We only come and listen and we are directed and given an answer and we practice and recite and we go home, that's it. And so this was very different for the Buddha to say, you have to question everything and you may not stay in our, in, in the Buddhist, uh, you know, meditation school in some places he, the monks, they have, they cannot stay here if they're not going to practice with knowledge and vision first in order to be able to um, grow their knowledge and wisdom. This knowledge and vision, knowing something by seeing it for yourself was the was the the foundation stone for building the structure, you see, that was missing before. And then day nine is your eightfold path. And I mean, it can be taught the way that I 
taught it to you here, um, which was in 141, or you can take the Kakachupama Sutta uh, number 21, uh, and you can go from there and teach the Eightfold Path from that Sutta. And then uh, Digha Nikaya number 28, um, that one has a section in it that talks that you go into that sutta, not to teach the whole sutta, but you talk about the progress chart. The Buddha left us a progress chart that we have so that we can measure our progress according to him. And one of the interesting things about this progress chart was that um, you had to have a, okay, I'll tell you what they were. The first one was um, a painful meditation with slow comprehension of the Dhamma is poor progress and a painful meditation with quick comprehension of the Dhamma was still considered poor progress by him. And then you had a comfortable meditation with slow comprehension was poor progress, but only the comfortable meditation with a uh, quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma was the excellent progress. And see, it was interesting because there were so there's so many practices today that say when pain arises, sit with the pain and they talk about the pain and all this pain. But the pain is not being talked about in, in the text that way. And and the and the same same thing happens with the hindrances, uh, the misunderstanding, uh, the hindrances by itself is a is a huge discussion because, but it has a simple solution, has one word for a solution, only one word, abandonment, that's it. It has abandonment was the answer. If we go back, when I look at the, I didn't tell you all these, these ones in the hindrances, but there's like just 10 of them are listed here, but in the research I'm doing for the hindrances, it's like, there's probably 30, um, suttas or more that say specifically, let it go, abandon it. It has nothing for you. It's it's only you're only feeding it every time you give your attention to it. You're giving it nutriment, and that's the bummer. And somehow we have latched on to what happened before the Buddha was teaching, where these hindrances were looked at as enemies. And they were thought to be something that we needed to destroy and annihilate, eradicate, suffocate, subdue, press down, stop the hindrances, you know. And here, and here we go inside the um, inside the text, and it's uh, let it go, relinquish it, uh, relax it, let it be. Just don't pay any attention to it. But the but the whole, no matter what they say, no matter what words they use. The end result down here is abandonment. And the lectures that are in the Samyutta Nikaya are very distinct about the nutriment uh, for the nutriment, what is it called? The, the nourishment and denourishment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the seven enlightenment factors. And you cannot experience going through without these seven factors of enlightenment coming into perfect balance. So there you are. The door is closed. You cannot go through the door unless you abandon these hindrances completely. So that's another topic. <laughs> you press the talk button. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed visiting us. I hope you'll come back again. We never know what's going to happen here, but we, we um, I was going to ask you all, I would like you to write me a note and please let me know if you'd like to go through uh, the foundation, uh, foundation again. Do you want to try to go through the foundations to go through it again? Whether I'm looking for something organized that I can say systematically, and then if I'm not there for some reason, I mean, Bhante can always keep going with one of them or he can fill in what uh, we were doing, uh, where you were going into Ang um, Angudra Nikaya, whatever you think. But I think we should uh, try a foundation. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I'd like to pull in 
yeah, I would really like to pull in some new people to do it because see what this is, um, Maria, basically this is a time, I done it a number of times, but originally it had 23, had 23 um, installments. And it, I think it's 17 of them are there and we could try to finish it, you know, try to tune it up. We keep saying we're gonna tune it up and print it and we never do print it. <laughs> it's really funny. Maybe this time we could do each chapter and just turn it over to the printer. Maybe we should do it that way, you know? So it would be nice if you all let me know what you think about this, okay? And um, I'm happy to see all your happy faces. I wanna go to that forest there, Everett, and I wanna go to the moon. Jay has always got me wanting to go to the moon. <laughs> Okay, so I hope everybody had a good class. Any other questions? Again, any other questions pop in your mind? No questions. Good teacher, okay, <laughs> here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll see you next time. Also, there's a Wednesday class. If you want to come into the Wednesday class, you're welcome. Uh, we usually put up a sign for a Wednesday's class a little bit different time. Six okay. Time. I will give you a link also. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank bye, you. bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.